Alright, welcome back. In this part we'll be looking at how to animate a basic property. For example, we're gonna be looking at how to animate the alpha value of a crate. We're gonna look at how to create an override material that can then be changed using a slider. After that we'll be looking at some more advanced use cases, but that's gonna be for later. Now, um, one thing that I'll need to say before we get started uh, what I'm gonna do is gonna be already replaceable by a built-in function of SFM. Like for example, what I'm gonna do is do the alpha value, so you see that's gonna make the crate more or less visible. But if you go to create animation set for elements, you can actually do this work all through using SFM. You see how it... Um, okay, you don't see it now, you need to show hidden controls and disable the scene here agree. Um, <laughs> you see how it creates the slider for us which does exactly what we want but of course there's two problems with that one it does this which is kind of unwanted you don't see it in the hierarchy it's all a bit stupid and second of all um, it only works with simple properties like for example dollar alpha but for example, what if we wanted to animate like dollar color? What if we wanted to have the red, green, blue values separately animatable? At that point, you don't see we don't even get the option. It's just um, not possible to do that using that feature. So while we won't look at this at, in this video, we're gonna still find out the basics just so that you get an idea of how it all works. After that, we're going to look at how to actually do something that SFM wouldn't normally be able to do. Okay, so let's get started. Now, we've already established how to do the transparency thing. It's just dollar alpha. It takes in a float floating point value between 0 and 1, and we want to create a slider that can animate this value for us. So let's start with the simplest and probably the most important part, the animation set. How are we going to control the value? Well, it's a simple float value between 0 and 1, so it would make the most sense to create a slider that goes from 0 to 1. So let's do that. We first go to the animation set of the crate, and then we create a new control. Now a control doesn't actually have a type. You see there is DME transform control, which includes some preset stuff, but a slider is just a DM element. It doesn't actually have its own properties. Or I mean its own class, sorry. Now we're gonna just call this one alpha value because that's the name it's gonna show in the list here. Um, and it's gonna need a few properties which we need to add on our own. First we have the value. This is the, the value that's actually gonna change when we drag the slider. We're also gonna have default value. This is obviously gonna be the default. We'll set this to 1. And we also have an element type which is gonna be the channel. This is going to be required later on so that the animation set knows who it belongs to. Alright, so this is all you're going to need for a regular old plain slider. Now, why don't we see it? Well, because we're not telling it to show up at all yet. So, we go to the root control group and we find out which uh, category it should be a part of. If you want to, we could either add it to the um, you know root level, so it wouldn't even have its own category, it would just be here. Or what I'm going to do is I'll create a new group. Let's call this one, um, <coughs> I don't know, just call this one materials. And give it a child, which is going to be under controls. And that's going to be the control. So copy and paste as reference into the control. And then you see it shows up here. This is our slider. Alright, fancy. Now we could, of course, change the group color, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Now you'll see one thing. The slider does not work. And that is because we haven't hooked, up it, hook, hooked it up to a channel yet. As I've already mentioned, the channel is what saves the values as well as passing them on. So without it being able to save a value, we could enter a value well, not even that seems to work, <laughs> but um, we can't change or store any values in it because it doesn't know what to do with the values. It doesn't have any way of storing them. So let's do that. This is going to be the second part of getting it to work. 
Um, I need to copy this because we'll need this later on. Um, let's go to the channels clip of the crate and create a new channel. It doesn't matter what this is called, it's just for organization purposes. So we're gonna call this one Alpha Saver. Doesn't really matter. <coughs> So now, how do channels work? This is a bit complicated, but the concept is pretty simple. You have from attributes and you have to attributes. These are the most important ones. You basically say, from where do we want to get some form of data? And here we say, where should we put this data to? So in our case, we have a value in the animation set of this slider, which we've copied just now. This is going to be where our data is going to come from, so that's why we put it in from element, paste as reference. Alright, so now we see from element is the slider. As you can tell, there's a property here or an attribute called channel. We're going to link it back to the channel that it's a part of. This is so that the animation set itself knows who gets my data, basically. It has something to do with linking them together, it wouldn't work otherwise, like if you forgot to do this. Alright, now we also need to specify a from attribute. This is where, from this element, which attribute it should take the value of, like the number in this case. So the attribute here is called value, so we're gonna type in value. Oh god, SFM crashed. Okay, we're back, sorry about that. Anyway, um, we've linked the channel back to the animation set, and we've entered the attribute value, so that means it's going to take the slider's value attribute and pass it on to somewhere else. If you want to take a value from an array, you just specify a from index as well, and there's also two index in case you want to save to an array. This is very rarely used, so you can just forget it for most of the time. Now, what should we do with this value? Well, we want to change the alpha of the crate, so why don't we tell it to do that? We go to our materials, we take the crate material here and copy it. We see this is the one with the alpha value stored. We go back to our channel and set that as the to element. So now we say it should write it to the attributes called $alpha. Alright, now the last thing that we need to do before it's actually gonna work is to take notice of the mode property. This is an integer value which basically decides how the channel is gonna use this data. So while we're saying it should go from here to here, there's still multiple ways to make it work. Now, I don't know the values off the top of my head, but there's only gonna be two that you'll be needing anyway. Um, one basically means it's just going to pass the values along. This is, for example, if you have a chain of like five channels that do some intermediate work like calculations or something you don't want to store the animation values for every step of the way because you're only going to be animating the slider and nothing not like the expression or something in between so this is one just passing it along this is the default value which is kind of stupid because what you'll be using most of the time is mode number three this one basically means to save the animation data as well so whatever it gets from here, it's going to also save it in something called a log. We'll see this in effect very soon. Alright, so um, now we can see the slider does something. And if we go and animate it, it's also just going to animate fine. Now, if we take a sneak peek into the log, we can actually see how it all works. You have the float log, that's the type of data we have. We have a floating point value because that's what dollar alpha is. And inside of here you see that there is different time values. These are measured in seconds, I believe. Or yeah, it's seconds of when it's twenty four FPS, it's a bit weird. And here you have the values that it's set to. So you're kinda saying that it has a transition over here and all that. It doesn't matter too much, just know that this is where this data gets saved. There is actually a bug, which I'll get to when it happens, <laughs> but um, this, you'll need to know what this is at that point anyway. Alright, and that is honestly all that you need to do to animate a slider, I suppose. 
it's quite underwhelming, I agree. I mean, just having one slider do all this work, but especially if you could just do it using a SFM made feature or any goodly made Python scripts, I suppose. But um, we are honestly far from done here. There's a lot more to discover and to have fun with. So that's what we're gonna be looking at next time. But before that, let's actually first check out some other uses of this technology. I mean, you wouldn't really know what to do with this or why you'd even bother learning it in the first place if you didn't know what you could do with it. So one example that I actually made a Python script for is my camera sample settings script. You see what this does is it allows you to animate the depth of field and motion blur quality of a camera. So you see, like, if you have a shot which is pretty long, but you know that at some point there's gonna be a really strong depth of field and another time you'll have a lot of motion, you wouldn't want to uh, render with very high samples all the time. It's just gonna break your PC. So what you could do is you could animate these numbers the same way as we did with the alpha, and then have it adjust based on how much you actually need at the moment. You'll even see these changes live, so if we see here... Okay, you, you won't really see it um, with this setup. So let's get a bit closer to our beloved crate, get a higher aperture going. And oh, I'll make it even higher so you see it on YouTube as well. Alright, so this is 8 samples, and we could now change it to like 128 samples. You see, it does more samples here, it gets way smoother and all that. This is pretty useful stuff, and of course if you're rendering you want to hide all that, so there is a slider here which allows you to change the size of each of them, as well as completely hiding everything. Pretty useful. And now you might be wondering how is all that done? Well, obviously with the same technology we're just learning, so here are the four sliders, completely basic stuff. Um, the properties we're animating are part of the camera DAG, which are called depth of field quality and motion blur quality. Here you see the slider goes from 0 to 7 and this one goes from 0 to 5. Not sure why it's not animating right now. It's ch actually changed the value, it just not, doesn't update it. There we go. Anyway, yeah, the, you might have noticed some of this is pretty buggy. SFM is not really good software. And most of the magic is going on inside of the channels. Now you see there's a huge, huge, it's actually this many, th these are all the, sam uh, the channels needed to make this work. It's quite insane. You actually don't need as many to make it work at all, but of course having these sliders change the size, have it move up and down as well, and having the name of the camera up here, so if you rename this one to blah, then you might, yeah, you see it updates to blah as well. All of this stuff is being done inside of channels, which are pretty amazing stuff, honestly. Now, um, we're gonna not learn how to do this. This is all up to you in the end, actually t making use of my information. I'm just gonna show you the basics and the technology involved, and then you'll be able to do the stuff yourself. Anyway, I hope this gave you a bit of an idea on what you could do with it. There's, of course, a lot more that I already covered a bit, like, for example, changing the intensity of a light dynamically. If you want to have a fire, then you could have, like, you know, this kind of effect going on or something. Or, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of possibilities that I can't think of myself, and I hope that there's gonna be some others of you who are gonna discover them for me. Anyway, that's it for the basics. Now we're gonna get into the next part. Well, okay, next time we're gonna get into the next part, which is gonna show you how to work with it a bit more advanced way. We're gonna learn how to animate something like a vector 3, like a color, or, yeah, working with operators, basically. Alright, well, see you then.